The Persian Constitutional Revolution was a series of conflicts between 1906 and 1911 where the people of Iran fought with the Shah and his backers. The goal of revolutionaries was to abolish the despotic rule of the Shah and to establish a parliament. The revolutionaries temporarily managed to achieve their goals. This era of Iranian history is thus especially interesting because in this period Persians got the right to vote for the first time, because the Persian state became more secularized and tolerant, and because the role of women in society improved. Another reason why this era should be studied is because the revolution was eventually toppled by Russian and British nations. But, not to get ahead of ourselves to understand the underlying causes of the revolution, we must go back in time. Persia was often the cradle of expansive empires. However, in the 18th century, the great Safavid dynasty, ruling Persia from the 16th century, collapsed. From the rubble, many competing realms emerged, with the Qajar dynasty coming out on top. Already the Qajar's mended country was far inferior and less expansive than the Safavids, but as Qajar Persia entered the 19th century, things would only get worse. Over the years, they lost many wars with Russia and would end up ceding Central Asia and the Caucasus, obtaining essentially the modern-day borders of Iran. While the decline of Persia can be partially attributed to Russia growing in power and taking over some of its peripheral territories, it is generally thought that it was mechanisms of capitalism and globalization that actually crippled Persia the most in the 19th century. What do I mean by that? Well, in the 19th century, economy was becoming more and more globalized. Persia entered the global market as a weak state and would only lose more and more through global trade. Silkworm disease was brought on by merchants, which was bad for a country so reliant on the production of silk garments. Silver prices dropped steadily as mines opened across the New World, which led to the Persian silver currency becoming cheaper and cheaper. The market was not protected and flooded with cheap garments from abroad, which led to the closing of local manufactories. To pay for the imported goods, agriculture shifted from food crops to cash crops, like opium and tobacco. Couple that with the population rising steadily through the 19th century, and you can see that food security was decreasing and poverty was on the rise. Then, another reason for why the revolution would break out was that despite the state losing power on a global scale, its rulers continued to maintain a tight grip over the country's population. The Shahs ruled in a fashion similar to their predecessors going back centuries through what researchers call arbitrary rule. So in short, there was a feudal-style social order, with the Shah holding considerable amount of power comparable to or greater than Western absolutist monarchies. The Shah was not bound by any set of laws and could do whatever he pleased with his subjects' lives and their properties. His power extended to even the highest government officials whom he could have executed without any warning if he so pleased. Then, the obsolete absolutist social order and the decreasing material conditions of the population overlapped to give the third reason why the country was ripe ground for revolution to spring up. There was a prevalent view that corrupt, aristocratic, high-ranking officials, including the Shah himself, were gradually selling Persia to foreign powers. A particularly evident example of this was when, in 1891, a concession was granted by the Shah to a British company that gave them a monopoly to handle the sale and export of Persian-grown tobacco. A quarter of the profits that the company made on that monopoly was to be diverted to the Shah and his ministers. This led to protests and a fatwa was issued against the use of tobacco. Fatwa can be thought of as a legal opinion within the Sharia law, issued by an important Muslim cleric. Overnight, people ceased using tobacco and the Shah had to cancel the concession. Fourthly, globalization also led to the spread of Western ideas of representation, democracy and the freedom of press. Social, democratic and nationalistic secret societies, or Anjumans, were forming that postulated the formulation of a parliament, the Majlis. So far we have looked at long-term factors that contributed to the outbursts of the revolution. In a metaphorical sense, these were like dry wood ready to burst into flames at the touch of a spark. Now to look at such sparks, or small-scale events that preceded the revolution. So throughout the 1800s, Qajars oversaw a gradual decline of their country. However, they held a tight grip on power. Nasser ad-Din Shah ruled for 50 years, but was assassinated by a religious fanatic in 1896. His successor, Mozaffar ad-Din Shah, was however a weak or possibly mentally challenged man who would play a large role in the upcoming events. Another key event that paved way for the revolution was when in 1905 a short-lived revolution broke out in Russia. 
As stated, by that time, Persia had become rather dependent on foreign resources, and the revolution greatly reduced trade flow into the region. Prices of basic commodities started rising, and the social disorder grew in proportion. The straw that broke the camel's back, however, was when a governor of Tehran tried to blame merchants for high prices of sugar in 1906, and he had them flogged in public. It was this blame-shifting and corruption of high-ranking officials that caused the outrage that turned into a full-scale revolution. It was unlike any other revolt in Persian history, where usually the course of action of the revolutionaries was to overthrow the corrupt ruler and replace him with a just one. This time the revolutionaries sought to alter the social order to gain representation and curtail the Shah's power. They sought to end the century-old tradition of arbitrary rule. As one historian puts it, it was a struggle by subjects and servants, including landlords, merchants and others alike, to become not so much citizens in the strict European sense of this term, as persons. It was a demand for all to enjoy security of life, limb and property. Surprisingly, the frail Mozaffar ad-Din Shah was particularly ill during this time, eventually agreed to the protesters' demands in the same year. Just like that, in 1906 a revolution occurred without any major bloodshed. Sadly, in the upcoming years, much blood was spilled in order to maintain revolutionary gains. Mozaffar ad-Din Shah made the concessions in the summer of 1906, establishing the parliament, Majlis. Elections for the Majlis occurred in the autumn and went smoothly, next a constitution was passed by the Majlis by the end of the year. Due to it, the following were introduced. Voting rights to men above the age of 25 were granted, to those whose net worth was above a baseline value. 156 members were present in the parliament. Tehran was overrepresented with 60 seats, while entire provinces had between 6 and 12 seats. A cabinet of ministers headed by a prime minister would be elected from agreements between the Majlis and the Shah. Especially in the first Majlis, the cabinet would be dismissed every few months. Elections were held for the Majlis every two years. Mozaffar ad-Din died a few weeks after the constitution was passed, in January 1907. He was succeeded by his son, Muhammad Ali Shah. Unlike his father, Muhammad Ali was in his prime and looking to restore the power that was given away by his father back to the monarchy. In 1907 and 1908, tension increased between the Majlis and the Shah. One of the events that contributed was when one of the newspapers criticized and mocked the Shah. He demanded to have the newspaper closed. The Majlis, however, saw this as a breach of constitutional rights and blocked the trial. On another occasion, an attempt was made on Mohammed Ali Shah's life. The assassin was never found and this led to the Shah arresting some suspected culprits, which was a breach of what he could do under the constitution. As time went on, hostilities grew and by the end of 1907, the Shah had gathered his Cossack brigade outside Tehran, as well as arrested some radical members of the Majlis and even temporarily apprehended the prime minister for a short time. To explain the Cossacks that I just mentioned, the Persian Cossacks were an elite brigade composed of Circassians and Persians with Russian officers. It was established by Nasser ad-Din Shah, the one who ruled for 50 years and was assassinated. Uh, it generally was loyal to the Shah, but it also represented Russian interests to some extent. This is a good pretext to segue into talking about these interests. Basically, the two colonial superpowers that sought to control Persia were Great Britain and Russia. Through the 1800s, their influence was definitely present, and we can look back at 1891 tobacco concession to a British company, or the Persian Cossacks established in 1879, but it was from 1907 onwards that their influence started to border on threatening Persian independence. Then, the Anglo-Russian Treaty was signed by the two powers. The Anglo-Russian Treaty of 1907 helped to establish the Triple Entente of World War I, and according to it, Afghanistan was to be British, Tibet was to remain neutral, while Persia was divided into a northern Russian sphere of influence and a southern British sphere. Classic, western-style straight lines were drawn through Persia, with a disfigured buffer zone claimed by neither power remaining in the middle. Hence, while Iran was an independent nation, the two superpowers agreed to carve it up and promote their interests in their respective regions. Russia possibly wanted the north for access to Iranian mines as well as for constructing a railway there. Britain, on the other hand, wanted control over trade routes of southern Persia. 
Therefore, both powers are actively promoting their interests in Iran from 1907 onwards. It should be noted that the Majlis, understandably so, refused to de jure accept this agreement, although a lot of its effects were felt by the Majlis. Returning to Muhammad Ali Shah, an uncertain compromise was reached, which prevented the threat of an imminent attack of the Cossack Brigade. Under it, the Shah promised to respect the Majlis and dismissed some of his most hated advisors, while the Majlis also punished some of its most radical opponents of the Shah. However, a standoff between the Shah and the Majlis continued into 1908. During this time, the Russian and British legations sided with the Shah and sent threatening telegraphs to the Majlis to back down and accept the Shah's demands. Also, the Russians sent a message to the Shah urging him to destroy, in quotes, all the democratic trappings that both the Russian consul and the Shah ardently hated. Eventually, the Cossack Brigade was sent into the city, the building of the Majlis was surrounded and shelled with artillery. Most constitutionalists were apprehended or exiled, some were killed. Tehran was therefore captured very quickly by Mohammed Ali Shah's forces. On the other hand, the siege of Tabriz becomes the most dramatic center of resistance.